welcome to Crying Out Cloud, the podcast that will make you laugh, cry, and reconsider all of your cloud security fears. I'm Eden, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Amitai. Hello, hello. We're going to jump into it. What cloud news topics do we have today? So speaking of clouds, uh, Scattered Spider is going after the the airplane money. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about uh, two new initial access vectors. One is a teleport vulnerability, and the other is a misconfiguration in open web UI. Um, and following up on the on the AI stuff, uh, we're going to talk a bit about a blog post from Simon Wilson uh, talking about the lethal trifecta for AI agents, uh, which we found very interesting. And well titled. Okay, starting with Scattered Spider. We spoke about them not too long ago when we were talking about how they went after the British UK retail sector. Um, and since then, they shifted their focus to insurance. And now, da 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 da, the aviation industry. Um, they successfully hit Hawaiian Air and WestJet. So, sucks if you're going to Hawaii or Canada. Um, but what's interesting, or maybe not interesting, because we even already went over this, is both Mandy and the FBI have been observing these attacks and noting that they're using the same tricks, which is targeting help desks and using phishing. And I think it's interesting what's come to light since the initial attacks about the help desks. Um, the internet's been popping with some crazy stories. Amitai, care to share? Yeah, so since um, this has been going on, uh, some employees have been like posting anonymously on social media, sort of sharing uh, stories from their uh, IR engagements with uh, with incidents related to, to Scattered Spider. A few companies have been a bit more like forthright about uh, what, what happened. And uh, I think Relia Quest put out a blog post talking about how they, how Scattered Spider basically impersonated like the CFO of one of the companies. Uh, like this is go, this goes back to the retail stuff um, and how they successfully uh, pretended to be the CFO just by having access to a few of his personal details and the things you could find online, like, like not like crazy personal details. Yeah. Like it was basically stuff that all, just due to the way the internet works and, and, and the way the world works, and I think the 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 the, uh, the Reddit uh, the Reddit stories are are especially uh, interesting just because they're so revealing. I mean, they might not be true; it might be something pretending to be an employee. But assuming they're true and they sound true, um, it seems like uh, like the the help desk targeting has been incredibly uh, useful for uh, for Scattered Spider. It seems like Scattered Spider basically found a a zero day in the form of uh, of the, of these help desk companies. Um, where if there's like a few employees who just aren't good at their job, that's equivalent to and possibly even better than finding a vulnerability, a zero-day vulnerability in some really prevalent product. Yeah. What should be your takeaway if you're one of the industries or maybe one of the industries to come? So I think, um, as always, making sure you at, at the very least have MFA uh, enabled and enforced across, you know, your entire fleet and... Uh, that 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 is still proving effective. Um, additionally, having uh, defense in depth uh, guardrails, like so that even if an attacker gains access to an employee, you have some sort of monitoring on what your employees are doing, uh, making sure that um, employees aren't suddenly accessing uh, pieces of information or resources that they haven't been accessing until now. Um, those are a bit more difficult, I think, to to implement. You know, really well without generating too much noise. Make sure that your help desk uh, team is well trained and knows what they're doing and knows what to check for. Make sure you have really strong protocols in place. Like I think we, we mentioned this last time, but one of the things that um, some of these companies have been enforcing is making sure that when someone asks to reset their password, it has to be either uh, in a like physical one-on-one -on -one meeting or at the very least like on Zoom, so they can actually see the person that, that that's requesting it. Um, which again, with, with deep fakes these days, isn't necessarily effective, but it's way better than nothing. Okay, next story. Let's go into some vulns, vulns of the week, of the month. Um, the teleport critical bypass um, has been a significant new vulnerability that was found when we were preparing this episode. 
the details were kind of under embargo and there wasn't much details other than the patch both the client and server sides. But the latest update that we have is that... Well, they released a root cause analysis report, uh, which goes into detail about how they discovered the vulnerability, um, the specific areas of code that it affects, uh, what steps they took. Um, one of the things they mentioned, which is something that we that we worked on, is that they reached out uh, to us uh, in order to make sure that we had detection for this vulnerability. Uh, so that's what we, we were working on uh, about a few weeks ago. Um, it's still unclear, though, how easy this is to exploit. And I don't think there, like, as of the date of this recording, I don't think there are any, like, proof of concept exploits available. Um, but considering the amount of effort that Teleport are putting into making sure everybody's patching, um, they even, like, changed their licensing agreement temporarily to allow for people to, to patch even if they're not uh, paying customers. And um, they seem to really want their customers to patch this. So I think this is something that should be treated as severe. Uh, we're going to continue monitoring this to see um, if it if it gets exploited in the wild and, and and in general, like what conditions for for exploitation are required and whether those conditions are are prevalent. Do you think that this will live up to its perceived hype? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, pre-announcing vulnerabilities. I think I've said this a few times before on this podcast. I think it 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 gives defenders an advantage over attackers in most cases. Um, but the problem has been that with high profile cases where details were under embargo um, and a patch was like pre-announced, um, the problem is that it's often been sort of a, a cry wolf situation. It almost always turns out to be less of a big deal um, than it's made out to be. Like, I have yet to see a vulnerability that was published under embargo where everybody was like, wow, good choice. Uh, so I think it, it remains to be seen whether this is a case that, that justifies that embargo, uh, but we'll see. We shall see. How can you tell if you're affected and what should you do if you are a teleport user? Uh, just refer to their advisory. Um, check if you have any of the affected versions uh, installed. I'm pretty sure it affects all versions. Um, but don't take my word for it. And um, just follow the instructions of the advisory. For the next story, we have the open web UI misconfig that has been exploited for crypto jacking. Open web UI instances, which are self hosted interfaces for LLMs, it was discovered that um, there's an active exploitation where when it's exposed to the internet with administrator access enabled and no authentication. Which honestly, just saying that out loud just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Uh, created an open door for attackers. Um, can you go in a little bit deeper into how it worked? So this is basically another case of um, an AI-related tool um, not built to be publicly exposed um, and users deciding to publicly expose it anyway and not putting it behind any authentication or any sort of firewall. And it's almost deterministic that when it's popular enough and when it allows you to do things like um, prompt LLMs or run code, then attackers are going to get wind of that and they're going to abuse it for whatever. Uh, in this case, it was crypto jacking just because it gives you access to the underlying compute if the compute is powerful enough, um, which it often is because it needs to run models, then uh, that's going to give you, I don't know, a few, a few dollars worth of, uh, of Bitcoin, I guess. Um, which again, it's free for the attackers. So what do they care if they get $10 out of it or a thousand? Again, this isn't the first time this has happened. We've seen it with, I think with Ray, uh, we've seen it with a few other, uh, AI related, uh, applications. I don't think this is the fault of the developers. I think this is more, um, AI users, AI consumers need to be much more careful about uh, their architecture. They need to give thought to uh, the security aspects of this. Um, these tools aren't meant to be used on the internet. They're, me they're meant to be used uh, inside your environment where they're behind a firewall and only available to you. So I think this is a good time to tra transition to Simon Wilson's blog post, which talks about a lethal trifecta for AI agents. But what he really talks about is if you have the combination of three things, which is access to your private data, exposure to untrusted content, and the ability to externally communicate, 
Um, that's your lethal trifecta. It's a very dangerous characteristics that presented together make it very easy for an attacker to steal your data. Yeah. So what he noticed was that um, there was a com there was like a commonality between a lot of the recent vulnerabilities being discovered um, in AI agents and things like Copilot and uh, the equivalents to Copilot um, uh, developed by other companies where uh, security researchers kept finding like the same underlying issue and uh, um, just exploiting like the same basic set of problems that, that, that seems to exist in these, in these, uh, in these implementations of agents. Um, and what's frustrating, I think, is that it seems like a lot of these companies are making the same mistake across multiple product lines and companies aren't necessarily learning from each other's mistakes. And they aren't necessarily um, assigning enough importance to to making sure that they that they don't make these mistakes in the first place. And I think again, it, it's really interesting. It it reminds me a bit of um, what we noticed when we were working on on Peach, uh, which is a framework that we built based on our research into tenant isolation vulnerabilities in in uh, in SaaS and PaaS services, where a lot of the vulnerabilities were basically exploiting the same set of underlying problems. Um, so we sort of went about to make sure that uh, people were more aware of these problems and why they're significant and sort of how to to, to, to fix them at an industry level. Um, and that's kind of why we we set out to build the uh, the Peach framework. And I think this is very similar um, in, the, in, in respect to AI agents, where AI agents have sort of functionality that you need and functionality that you don't necessarily need. And when those things interact, it, become, it becomes a problem. I think that makes sense, right? That we're repeating the same issues and we need to kind of learn from each other and not do that. But if you were to dive into this trifecta, like what can you actually control, right? Like what is, where are the points where, I mean, there's certain things that are, not, I don't want to say inevitable, but are just characteristic of working with a, uh, with these AI agents. So like. Like where, where, where would you put the mitigations? Like what, what, what do you have that wouldn't break the product? I think um, as, as Simon mentioned, Access to private data is a feature. Like you can't get rid of it because this is the goal of using these agents in the first place. You want them to have access to your data because you want them to manipulate your data and you want them to use your data. Um, so you can't get rid of that. The ability to externally communicate, like for the agent to be able to reach out to the internet to fetch things that are that are on the internet, sometimes you can live without that. Um, and when you can avoid it, then then that is a good security measure. But in many cases, you don't want to. You want the agent to be able to pull, you know, packages from, from package repositories. You want it to be able to read documentation. Um, one way to deal with that is a whitelist, like only let it communicate with a set of resources that you uh, uh, decide it should be able to, which is how some of these agents are, are designed. Like you have to s assign them certain data sources and then they can only reach out to those, which is one way of, of implementing a guardrail. But generally speaking, to the, the more freedom you give the agent in terms of the things that can, it, it can reach out to, uh, the better it's going to be because the internet is a big place and you can't know ahead of time uh, what's going to be useful to you. Yeah. You know, maybe one way to solve that is through prompting the user and, and, and requesting permission to reach out to certain thing, which is things, which is another uh, uh, design choice that some of these agents are, uh, um, are using. Um, but I think that the, the main problem and the thing that, that can be avoided and it's complicated to avoid, but it should be, is the, 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 the point on exposure to untrusted content. Just like you want the agent to have access to your private data, you want it to have access to untrusted content, right? You want it, again, to be able to read documentation on the internet, even if it's stuff you don't control. Um, you want it to be able to collect as much information as it can. But the problem is that you don't want it to be affected by that information in a way that could be risky. You don't want the information that the agent is fetching from documentation or from a, a pull request or from just some random uh, note that it finds on some random website, you don't want that to even have the possibility of injecting a prompt into your system. You have to assume the worst and assume that everything the agent is going to fetch from untrusted sources is going to be malicious. Don't be optimistic. Yes, that's 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 the way that security often works. <laughs> you have to be, you have to be suspicious and uh you have to be very uh pessimistic sometimes 
So I think that the the main takeaway for me, at least, is that um, developers of these of these systems need to be able to differentiate between uh, different types of content, um, content that that is trusted and is created by the user should be treated entirely differently than uh, content that exists on the internet. If you want to read more about the lethal trifecta, we'll link the blog post. Um, but I think we have a ways to go in terms of like awareness, I think, spreading awareness and um, information to make sure that people aren't repeating this issue. To wrap it up, what are our potaways for this episode, Amitai? So our potaways or take pods or potapods are um, scattered spiders targeting the aviation industry. If you're if you're an airline op operator, then take note um, and make sure that you're prepping for this and reach out to your help help desk provider or if you have an internal help desk uh, team, make sure that they're aware that this is going on. Um, make sure you have protocols in place to make sure that when people are calling in to reset their passwords, then you have a way to to truly verify that you know who you're talking to. For the other things, uh, if you have uh, teleport, then make sure uh, to patch uh, this latest vulnerability. Uh, if you if you are using Open Web UI or basically any other uh, AI related tool, um, make sure you don't expose it to the internet if it's not meant to be exposed. Make sure you have authentication and firewall rules uh, in place. Um, and if you have had Open Web UI exposed or or any other number of these tools, then make sure you have monitoring in place to make sure that you can detect if they've been turned into into crypto, crypto jacking um, zombie machines. Um, and uh, regarding the lethal trifecta for AI agents, uh, let's hope that the industry as a whole is able to improve and is able to learn the right lessons. Um, if you are developing AI tools, I highly suggest you read this blog post and stay up to date on uh, vulnerabilities being discovered in, in other AI tools, just to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes as others. Cool. So if you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe and share a link to your podcast, but not your cloud keys. And as always, if your cloud security strategy is making you cry, don't worry. Just cry out cloud. Security.